Hey everyone, just checking in to work some more problems with you guys. This is for our main lecture on Thursday, May 7th, 2020. And um, we're going to start working equilibrium problems, uh, which is chapter 12 material. And the equilibrium, now that we're talking about rotation, uh, means not moving and includes not just sum of forces zero, but sum of torques zero. And loosely translated, you can think about this as not translating and not rotating. And this combined is what we mean by not moving. So now we have rotation and translation. Not moving is both of these conditions. And so we're gonna be talking about objects that are effectively static and talking about them not moving. <laughs> so instead of sum of forces being MA and sum of torques being I alpha, we're just going to consider them in the static situation and kind of look at the boundaries between what right before they would move, um, if they would move, but still not moving. I'm going to start this problem um, by introducing kind of a basic problem. And um, this is also an equilibrium problem where I have, I have a mass. Uh, and this mass is going to take the form of a rod. Whoops, let me draw this a little bit thinner. So this should be kind of a one-dimensional rod, but it um, doesn't really look one-dimensional here, but we're going to go with that. And on its left-hand side here, we're going to say it's either pinned or hinged uh, against this wall. So here's my wall. And in addition to it being pinned or hinged, there's also a rope attached to it at the very end of the rod. And that rope is also attached right here to the wall as such. And so uh, this is a rope. And right now we're going to say it's at an angle of theta with respect to the horizontal. Now, this rod, which, you know, is really, like a lot of times I'll call it a beam in the problem, has mass m and length l. And in addition to this configuration, there's also a man kind of walking out onto the rod. And he's touching the, the rod, walking out, and um, he is going to have, well, if I follow suit with the handout that I have, um, I would actually give him a weight. So let's do that. We're gonna say the weight of the man is W sub M, and actually, instead of saying the beam has a mass, I'm going to go ahead and say the beam has a weight, W. So really, weight, remember, is just mg. It's just the force of gravity. So um, if I had known m, I just would have said w is mg. And similarly, this would be just the mass of the man times g. <clears throat> but for our purposes in this problem, we're going to know the weight of the man, the weight of the rod, the length of the rod, the angle theta, and that is going to be it. Oh. Um, we're also going to know the tension in the string, okay, for our problem. So here under our list of known quantities, um, here we do, here we have it. There's a lot going on here. So even though that looks like a big list of knowns, I'm actually going to end up solving for three unknowns. And I'm going to get to that in a second because we're going to end up with three equations so we can have three unknowns in this problem. Um, so right now, what I'm going to do is just kind of begin to treat this problem and to try to understand um, just setting it up and then think about what I know versus what I don't know. Okay. 
So just to begin a problem like this, where I say I have no rotation and no translation, you know, ultimately what I'm really talking about is the beam. The beam is not rotating, the beam is not translating. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just begin this problem by performing a force body diagram just on the beam itself. So here's my beam again. <clears throat> and uh, it's a uniform beam. So I'm gonna right away just start by locating the center of mass of the object here in the geometric center. So here's the center of mass. And then I'm gonna say, well, that's where gravity acts. It treats it as a point mass. That's where gravity is acting. And so the weight of the beam is gonna act right there. So again, when talking about forces and force body diagrams, now that I have these rigid bodies, right, they have length and a distribution of mass that I'm really starting to consider, it's very important to draw the force where it acts on the body. So here I am drawing the weight at the center of mass. I'm going to look now for contact forces. And so oh, over here, contact with the rope. So I'll have the force of tension acting on my mass right here. Um, I also have contact right here with the man, and um, he's going to be pushing downward on it with a normal force. And, you know, just to kind of get that out of the way, the equal and opposite normal force is going to be acting on the man too. And in addition to that, gravity is also going to act on the man. And since the man is not moving in the y direction, um, I also know that that normal force happens to be equal to the weight of the man. So even though I'm writing this as a normal force, because technically it is, I'm going to be rewriting this as the weight of the man, because that's really the, the weight that's being felt. In addition, there's one more point of contact on the rod, which is right here, and that's where it's pinned or hinged. And I know we've talked about this before, but when something is pinned or hinged like that, um, there's a force like a normal force, <clears throat> but it's like a normal force on a round object. So like if this is my pin, the fact of the matter is, is that the beam could be resting on it like this, giving a force like that. It could be resting on it like this, giving a force like that, because it's kind of got infinite degrees of freedom with which to rest on this kind of round object. So when I talk about a pinning or a hinging force like this, <clears throat> I really don't know its direction. So this is arbitrary. It, it could point like this, it could point like this, it could point like this. Instinctually though, I already understand just by looking at this thing that since I've actually now accounted for all the forces on my force body diagram, that in order for the sum of forces to be zero, there actually has to be a component of the force pointing this way in the x. So I know that pinning force is pointing at least with its x component that way. Its y component is a different story. Um, there is a y component of tension to counteract both of these weights. So it's possible the y component doesn't have to point this way, or it could be zero, or the y component could point that way, but most likely it's pointing this way. And in fact, uh, if I thought about the sum of torques acting on the system, I can actually prove to you in just in one second that the pinning force does in fact have to have a positive Y component um, to go with its positive X component like that. So this would be the correct way. And I'll justify that in just a second. So this is my force body diagram. And I'm going to go ahead and begin by saying, okay, well, um, I'm going to treat the sum of forces zero and the sum of torques zero, the equilibrium condition. Uh, now, the thing about the sum of forces zero is uh, it's great. Um, <laughs> all I have to do is break things up into the X and Y. You know, we have so much experience with this. And they're going to sum up to be zero, which is really the easy case. So um, sum of forces in the x, 0, sum of forces in the y, 0. I'll get two equations out of this one because I'm in the xy plane here. And so I'm going to go ahead and start with that. Um, for the tension force, of course, it'll become important that I have this angle theta written in right here. 
But for the P force, since it's the pinning force, since it's arbitrary, I actually don't know its direction. And so I'm going to go ahead and just give it an arbitrary angle of phi. Now, I could have put that angle of phi here. It doesn't really matter. Um, I'm just giving it to make it a little bit different, to break up a different triangle. And that's because that's also what I did in my notes. So if you go online um, under handouts, there is this problem is typed up for you in this file. Okay, so I'm just going to be consistent with what I have there. Um, sometimes with the pinning force, um, instead of doing it that way, people will just say, write the pinning force as a, a Y component and an X component. <clears throat> That's actually sometimes easier. And it's two unknowns, which is equivalent to these two unknowns. In fact, um, P sub Y is just going to be P cosine of phi, and P sub X is P sine of phi. So they're really equivalent expressions. And yeah, look at that, I just broke up this pinning force into its X and Y components. I should do the same for tension. Uh, the force of tension, oops, the force of tension can be broken up into also a component in the X and a component in the Y. This one will be the T sine theta, and this will be the T cosine theta. And so in redrawing this force body diagram, um, really, I'm going to have a P cos phi, a P sine of phi, a T cos theta, and a T sine of theta. Uh, weight of the man, weight of the rod. Now, again, I've drawn this one acts at the end. These, oh, they should act at the end. Let me just kind of, huh, that was funny. Let me just kind of make it look like they do. <clears throat> um, this weight of the rod, it acts right at the geometric center. Well, where does this one act exactly? And well, that's the thing, it acts wherever the man is. I, I don't really have a notation for that. So let me, let me put one in here. I'm gonna denote it with respect to this side over here. Maybe X away, maybe it's X away, uh, which means that it would be L minus X away from here if I was interested in that distance for some reason. Or um, this would be L over two minus X relative to the center. Anyhow, um, just call it X for now. And this is my force body diagram, which incidentally is significantly more easy just to plug the X components into here. And then the Y components into the sum of forces Y. And I'm just gonna pop out a couple of equations really quickly. P cosine phi minus T cos theta equals zero. That's from sum of forces in the X. From sum of forces in the y, I'll have, oops, made a mistake, sorry. This should be the sine of phi. And in the y, we have the cos theta. So we'll get p, I'm sorry, cos phi plus t sine theta minus weight or minus weight of the man, and that equals to zero. So let me go ahead and box these equations right here. I'm boxing them because I have two equations and presumably I'm going to have up to three equations once I use my sum of torques equations and again that will correspond to three unknowns and then we'll talk about what I'm solving for given a set of knowns. So that is just from the sum of forces and then finally that's going to leave me with the sum of torques equals to zero. So I'm going to change the page here. So, <clears throat> so here's my mass, and again, here's my pinning force. Here's my force of tension. Here's the weight of the man, and here's the weight of the beam itself. 
And I'm about to employ the sum of torques equals to zero condition. And um, what's important for torques, of course, is where is the axis of rotation? So uh, the beam is pinned here up against the wall. And I suppose if I was to cut the rope, it would rotate around this point. So if you're going to ask me where the natural axis of rotation probably would be, it'd be here. But the truth of the matter is this thing is not rotating. And so there, there is no axis of rotation currently. And it turns out, and it can be proven, that you can choose your axis anywhere. I can place my axis of rotation here, 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 anywhere along the rod. Now, this is a pretty powerful thing because I do tend to choose my axis to be kind of at the most convenient location, normally with the thing that I want to deny, or I'll tend to put it, um, strategically, I'll put it for sure where, where a force is. Like, for instance, if I put my axis of rotation here, that's where I'm going to put it. Because for me, if I did cut the rope, that's actually where it would rotate because it's pinned there. But in addition to that, by placing it, the axis of rotation there, I know that I know the torque from the pinning force is going to be equal to zero. And the reason I know that is because R is equal to zero, right? Uh, the distance from the axis of rotation to where the force acts is literally zero for the pinning force. So if I place the axis of rotation strategically on any one of these forces, the torque by that particular force would be zero. So like if I place the axis of rotation here, there would be zero force from the torque. And now bear with me, this is how I know that there's a component of the pinning force that points up this way, is because if I chose the axis right here, this would cause a rotation in the counterclockwise rotation direction. This weight would also cause a rotation in the counterclockwise rotation. But the pinning force, in order to make sum of torques zero, would have to cause a rotation in the clockwise direction, which is why I know it has to have a component in the positive y hat, not the negative. Because I can choose my axis anywhere, this tells me this one has to have a torque this way to counteract the two torques this way. Does that make sense? Okay. So now I've justified the positive y hat direction of the pinning force. That's good. So I've chosen my axis uh, strategically here on a force, but also where if the rope got cut, that's where it would actually rotate from. And um, so if the sum of torques equal to zero, normally remember I have torque from each possible force. So there's four forces. Um, I have a torque from each one represented. I've already argued that the pinning force is going to contribute zero because its R value is zero. And that's the only one that's zeroed out. All the rest of these forces have R vectors. Here's the R vector for weight of the man, for the weight of the beam. And here's the R vector for the torque, or the tension, excuse me, <laughs> T. And all of them have perpendicular forces, right? The weight of the man is completely perpendicular to its R vector. So is the weight of the beam. The tension, well, I'm going to have to find the perpendicular part of the force, but that won't be too hard. I'm going to go ahead and, you know, remember that I actually have this broken up already as a T sine theta component and a T cosine theta component. And so if I consider here's the R vector, the part of the force that's perpendicular is just the T sine theta component. Okay. So... The torque from tension, let's just start there. It's R vector. I'm going to look at the magnitude of its R vector, right? Because generally torque magnitude, I think about it as RF perpendicular. Um, its R vector has a magnitude of the complete length of the rod. So L times F perpendicular, well, we've already argued that that's T sine theta. 
that's the magnitude of the torque. The direction, again, is given to me by, is it in the clockwise or the counterclockwise? And with this pivot point, this is creating a counterclockwise rotation, which is associated with the positive Z hat direction. Let's look at the torque from the weight of the man. Uh, again, RF perpendicular for magnitude. Here's the R vector. Now, if you remember, we actually gave this a value of x. So lucky for me, um, I chose that to be x. And it's entirely its force of the weight of the man is entirely perpendicular to r. So um, the f perpendicular is just the weight of the man itself. And the direction of the rotation with respect to this axis of rotation will give me a clockwise rotation, which is the negative z hat direction. Similarly, uh, I can look at the weight of the beam. Its r vector, here it is, is has a magnitude of l over 2. Its force is entirely perpendicular to the r, so w, and it's also in the minus z hat direction. So that's the sum of torques. They're going to add up to be 0 z hat plus 0 x hat plus 0 y hat. And when I plug all these in, I'm going to get lt sine theta positive minus x weight of the man minus l over 2 w equals to 0 once I take it out of its vector expression. And I'm going to go ahead and box that guy too. So right now I have three equations. Let me pick out these others bring them all to the same page. So here are my three equations that I have to use. So I can have three unknowns now to solve for. Um, what I chose um, was in order to solve this, I was going to say that these three quantities were known, or these, whoops, one, two, three, four, five quantities were known values. which means I could then solve for three others. So I'm just going to highlight my unknowns. I know L, I know T, I know theta. I don't know X. I know weight of the man, I know weight. So the only thing I don't know in this first equation is X. I don't know P, I don't know phi. That was all to do with the pinning force. So let me go ahead and highlight that here. And everything else I know. So at this point, um, all I have to do is to solve these three equations for these three unknowns. So I've set up the equations kind of almost blindly without really thinking about it, and now I'm just ready to solve for unknowns, given my knowns. So x, don't forget, it's just the distance out the man has walked. And p and phi, those were associated with the pinning force and its you know magnitude and direction. So really what I'm solving for is p, the pinning force magnitude, its direction with respect to the vertical, and how far out the man makes it. So um, I can solve equation 1, and right away that's going to give me that x equals to lt sine theta minus l over 2w, all divided by the weight of the man. Okay, so just solving from one. And then, I'm not going to go through the algebra, but I can then combine two and three and get kind of a complicated expression in terms of my known quantities. Again, this would all be algebra. I would be solving for phi in terms of knowns and um, solving for p. And I could probably reduce this denominator with an identity for a sign of arctan. But honestly, I'm not going to. 
Okay. So here things are solved. And I mean, at this point, I could play around with things a little bit. Um, if I was going to do that, I would probably play around with this one right here, the x expression. And I, I might say something like, okay, um, the farthest that x can be. So you remember, you know, x is just associated with how far out the man was, right? Um, he was x away from the edge. So x can equal to l. That would be the, the farthest out that the man could be uh, with respect to the left-hand side. So what does it look like? What, what is the tension when x is equal to l? That would be a good question. Okay, so when x is equal to l, all I'm doing is replacing x with l over here. And then l's would just cancel out. And I would get this equation that says 1 equals t sine theta minus weight over 2 divided by weight of the man. Our weight of the man equals t sine theta minus the weight of the beam over 2. Or t is equal to the weight of the man plus the weight of the beam divided by 2 divided by sine of theta. So I could solve for the tension when x is equal to L. And then I could say something like, well, what if the, the maximum tension the rope could have before it breaks is the weight of the man plus one half the weight of the rod. You know, normally I would just give you numbers. Could the man make it out that far? And the answer is no, um, because it's divided by sine theta. The sine of theta is going to be range between 0 and 1. That means t is going to be, oops, t is going to be greater than t max, because this is just, excuse me, this is just t max over sine of theta. And so since sine of theta varies between 0 and 1, it's going to be larger than t max. And so, in fact, the man could not make it out that far. The, the rope would break. This is more interesting if I had given numbers. But, you know, this is just an example. Like, uh, maybe the numbers on this was like, you know, 10,000 newtons. And maybe this was 5,000 newtons or something like that. And you would be able to see, oh the maximum tension is 5,000, the guy couldn't have made it out that far. Because, you know, the farther he makes it out, the farther the, farther the rope is going to work, or the more the rope is going to work to hold the beam up. Cause, just because there's more torque. Okay. So that problem's uh, worked out for you, and the handout is online. So I guess it's kind of a real beginner problem for some of some forces, but we get some of the basics down. I'm going to move on to talk about another problem. It's kind of a basic problem as well. It's a ladder problem. But it's the same idea. The idea is that I have a ladder. And it's le actually leaning up against a wall. So I'm just going to make it look like a beam. Oh, or not. <laughs> Let me try that again. Make it look like a beam. which is kind of leaning up against a wall. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make a floor. And here's a wall. So this is the wall. And this is the floor. And I'm going to make it so that the floor is made out of kind of a different material than the wall. And it, it has friction on the floor. And the wall is super smooth and has no friction on it. Which is good. You want a floor to have friction, and the walls can be slippery. And I'm going to lean a ladder up. Oh, that's better. Against the wall. This is something we do. You have a ladder, you lean it up against a wall all the time. And you rely on the fact that there's friction on the floor to stop this thing from rotating. And I'm going to say that the angle of inclination right here is theta. And I'm going to kind of play around with it. And, and ultimately, the question I'm going to be asking is, what is the minimum theta that I can have before the ladder slips and starts to rotate slash translate? 
So to begin this problem, you know, I'm going to start the usual way by saying nothing is moving. So the sum of torques are zero and the sum of forces are zero. Because I'm working with forces and torques, I'm going to do a force body diagram. So here's the thing that has the potential to rotate and, or translate. What forces act on my system? Well, this is a uniform ladder, let's assume, big assumption. But that means wherever the center of mass happens to be, if it wasn't uniform, the center of mass would just be somewhere else, and that's where gravity would act on this. So M being the mass of the ladder here. Um, so that's gravity action at a distance, but there's also points of contact here and here. So there's a normal force here and a normal force acting here. Now these are not pinning or hinging forces, so they're going to be perpendicular to the surfaces that they're on, right? Just like they normally are, and they're not necessarily the same, so I'm going to give them two different names, normal force one and normal force two. And there's friction on the floor. Um, the friction has to point this way. Otherwise, the sum of forces could never be zero in the x. And so the force of static friction, in this case, again, because there's no relative motion between the ladder and the floor, otherwise it'd be kinetic, looks like this. And that's it. Those are all the contact points and my action at a distance forces. So um, here's my angle theta. Let me plug things into my sum of forces problem first, because, man, this is so nice. Everything's already broken up into the x and into the y. It's going to be super easy. Sum of forces in the x, I have f sub s minus n2 equals to 0. Sum of forces in the y, I have n1 minus mg equals to 0. And so I'll move on to sum of torques now. Now this one's a little harder, but I'm going to strategically place my axis of rotation right here to make it easier. When I place it right here, the axis of rotation, remember, I have a choice, right? I can place it anywhere, but I want to place it on forces because if I place it on a force, the torque from the forces, here it's two forces, so psh, great. The torque from N1 and F sub S is going to be zero because their R values are zero. So remember, as I add all the torques and sum up, up to be zero, I normally consider every single torque, right? One for each force. Um, and here, right away, I'm going to be able to say zero and zero because their R values are zero. Their distance away from the axis of rotation is zero. And really, that's going to leave me with two torques. So I think that's a pretty good strategic toy choice to place the axis of rotation, which, remember, I can place anywhere. Um, so, gosh, I guess I didn't really tell you, like, anything about what we know. But, uh, you know, we know the, the rod or the ladder has a mass m and a length l. You know, to find the minimum angle, I've got to tell you in advance, my, my only known to find it is just the coefficient of static friction. So, you know, this is all I need to solve for the minimum angle. So, like, if you see something like this, you know, you know the ladder still has a mass m and a length l. So we're just going to keep on using that, even though it may not be a known in our problem. And the reason I'm bringing up length is because I'm going to be focusing here on the torque from gravity, and I want to find r times f perpendicular. Well, my r value is going to be at L over 2, right, in magnitude. And so the torque from gravity, r times f perpendicular, well, the r part is L over 2. And then I need to find now the perpendicular component, which would be like this of mg. And I know we all know that I can break this component up to be mg cos theta. I know we've seen this before. Down the incline mg sine, perpendicular mg cos. So really, this is L over 2 crossed with perpendicular component. is just mg cosine theta. 
And with respect to this axis of rotation here, this mg force is going to cause a rotation like this, clockwise. So it's in the minus z hat direction. What about the torque from N2? It's R value, here it is the R vector, is the full length of the rod, so L. And I obviously, I have to break up a component of N2. I need to find the perpendicular component like that. So not too hard. Uh, this angle is also theta. So N2, with respect to theta, can be broken up into these two components, one parallel and one perpendicular. And in fact, the perpendicular component is N2 sine theta. So this will be the N2 sine theta component, which is perpendicular to the R vector L. So N2 sine theta, and this is in the positive Z hat because this normal force here would create a counterclockwise rotation with respect to this axis of rotation. So all of those torques are in the Z, which I anticipated, and I said they're going to add up to be zero in the Z. So I'll get L over 2 mg cosine theta minus Z hat plus L n2 sine theta positive Z hat equals zero Z hat. And that will give me minus L over 2 mg cos theta plus L n2 sine theta equals to zero. So right now, I again have these kind of three equations to work with. And what I'm trying to find is the minimum angle such that the ladder slips. So I know that this is associated with the friction here. And in fact, I'm sure that the smaller this angle becomes, the harder it is for the ladder to remain on the floor. So I'm just going to kind of keep scooting that angle down. And, and I understand that friction is going to work harder. So I'm going to focus on this first equation from the sum of forces in the x equals 0 and say, OK, well, the sum of forces equals n2. Well, um, n2 is also in this equation right here. So I'm going to solve for n2 from this equation and just go ahead and plug it in. Um, actually, looking at this, an L is going to cancel right out of this. It makes it easier to solve for n2 right away. I'm going to get n2 equal to mg over 2 cosine of theta over sine theta. Just solving for it here. Or n2 is equal to 1 half mg cotangent of theta. And so plugging that in for the force of static friction equals n2. I'm going to now think about maxing out my force of static friction by minimizing this angle. So if you know what cotangent of theta looks like as a function of theta, and I'm only going to be looking at theta between 0 and pi over 2 because honestly 0 and pi over 2 is the only possible range of thetas that I can have. Um, cotangent of theta becomes infinite at 0 and go and goes to 0 at pi over 2, so it asymptotes here, becomes infinite. So the smaller you make the angle, right, by going this way on the axis, the bigger the cotangent theta becomes. So by minimizing this angle, cotangent gets larger, and f sub s reaches its max, which I'm trying to hit because only the force of static friction is equal to mu static times the normal force. Which normal force, you say? Well, the normal force associated with the force of friction, n sub 1. So this isn't just any normal force. This is n sub 1. And I can come here to my other equation and say, well, n1 is just equal to mg, and plug that in. You see my mg is canceling. And at this point, I can now solve for the minimum angle
that I can have. before my ladder starts to rotate. It's just in terms of the coefficient. Okay, so that's the ladder problem. I believe in your homework, you have a similar problem, but now you're also gonna have a man walking up it. And it's probably gonna ask you, how far can the man get up before this thing starts to move? So similar, but just maybe with an extra torque acting on the system. Okay, so let's work another problem here. Oh, just kidding. Actually, I'm going to stop. I have a meeting in 10 minutes. <laughs> We've been talking for an hour exactly, so I will follow up with an extra 20 minutes on the next lecture. Maybe we'll just work another problem together. Um, but I'm going to refer you to a handout. I'm going to work this problem next with you guys. Um, so the next problem I'm working with you is going to be from a handle called beam torque dot PDF. So please go ahead and refer to it. And um, actually, I'll just after my meeting, I'll come back and finish recording that problem, and that will constitute Thursday's lecture. So this will be. We're finishing part one of two, and then my part two of two will be very short and based on this one problem. Okay. So, like that. I'll be talking to you guys soon. Bye.